<laughs> the president has um, refused to intervene directly um, in the current Syrian conflict, um, and this is this is from our committee member. Some critics say that uh, the cost of, of his inaction is the Syrian government's continued genocide of its own people. Some supporters say the president is right to keep the United States on the sidelines in the absence of a legitimate and desirable group that could replace the current regime. What should the United States do in this situation specifically? Does the country have any obligation to intervene to prevent genocide in this case? The President will continue not to intervene in Syria for a number of reasons. Uh, the first reason is that we already have our, and all of our allies in the region agree that we do not want another war in the Middle East. I think a lot of people here who do uh, partake in military strategy, Syria is a whole different animal than a lot of other places. It's urban, it has a higher urban population, it's a lot tougher for our military with our capabilities to start a full-ledged war with Syria. It would cost billions of dollars. We were just coming out of an economic recession. It is not worth the investment of spending another billion dollars, billions of dollars to get into another war. Um, also, um, like I said, our allies are, are not um, in support of it right now. And the last thing we want to go is go in unitary uh, by our own into Syria. Um, and so we have to have the support of our allies. We have been providing humanitarian aid and training to some forces in Syria. Um, however, we are not ready to commit unilaterally uh, to go into war. And I think that's the right policy. And I'm not exactly sure what Governor Romney's policy is because he said that he for going in sometimes. He's, he's not against putting troops in the war, but he is for planes in the sky. So I think Matt's going to do a good job clarifying the governor's stance. Matt, do you want to go ahead and clarify? Absolutely. Right. Um, I think Governor Romney's made his point pretty clear, and that is that he doesn't necessarily want to intervene with U.S. forces, but is what he'd rather do is he'd rather provide uh, the, the, uh, the, the rebellion uh, people who are, who are uprising there with the necessary weapons to make sure that they are adequately equipped to, to, to take down this regime. And if you look, I think the, the important issue here is that Syria, or excuse me, Iran is one of the most uh, important um, countries attached to this. And that is that Iran, Iran uh, views Syria as um, a strategic ally uh, within the current administration there. And we've seen 30,000, at least 30,000 deaths under this regime. And this is something that we clearly need to, to take down because Assad has been uh, uh, sending arms to them, um, or excuse me, Iran has been sending arms to Assad, um, and he knows that it would be a strategic defeat for them um, if, if they are successful. So we need to make sure that we're sending arms to the, to the, uh, the rebellion there and make sure that things are, are, are successful for our general outcome. It's also important that we need to increase economic sanctions, um, both on Iran and in Syria. Um, first off, I want to say that the president is, is, uh, has already shown commitment to increasing those economic sanctions. But my question for Matt and for Governor Romney's position is, can the governor guarantee that those weapons that we send to rebel forces do not get into the hands of the wrong people? Because that could cause an issue that's even worse than what we have right now. We can't, if we go in and send in weapons to certain people, who knows if those weapons can be turned on us strategically in the future? We don't, and that's why the president has been reluctant to interfere. Let me ask you, have you ever seen Charlie Wilson's war? I've heard of Charlie Wilson's war, I haven't seen the war. Okay. <laughs> it, it, Charlie Wilson's war, it's a great movie. I, I, this is something, uh, an issue where basically the same thing was happening in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Again, I'm not an expert on this. But it's a little different. It was it, extremely different. Well, let's let's explain. I, 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 I will say this about providing arms. Like, and President Obama has not disavowed the possibility of providing arms to the Syrian regime, which I think is a horrible mistake because President Obama can't even give. You know, he, he tried to provide arms to his own Justice Department that wound up in the hands of uh, Operation uh, Fast and Furious was, a president, was President Obama's policy and under his control. They were unable to control the weapons, so if President Obama can't even control the supply of weapons in their own country, how in the hell is he going to provide them control over the right. supply of weapons in Syria, which is a dysfunctional regime in which there's a civil war going on. So, I mean, don't get me wrong, Governor Romney wants to do the same thing, but I, I don't think you should be providing arms either way because the idea that we can somehow control who those weapons go to is ridiculous. Well, I think the greatest danger in Syria now is not providing weapons or who they would go to, but controlling the weapons that are already there. Syria has the largest stockpile of chemical weapons in the Middle East, and making sure that those don't get into the right hands, I think, is probably the United States' principal obligation right now. And you're talking, I think, Ed, you mentioned the fact that none of our allies 
would be behind us if we put our troops on the ground. And I would agree that putting troops on the ground wouldn't be the right response. Um, we don't have a vested interest in removing Assad that forcefully. We'd get ourselves into a situation of mission creep, and it wouldn't be economically feasible. But at the same time, to say that Erdogan is not supportive of our removing Assad, however we might be able to do that or pressure that, um, I mean, that's, I think, completely belies all the rhetoric that's come out of that region since the conflict started, Erdogan probably being the strongest ally we have um, in that part of the world, forcibly trying to, to end uh, you know, the reign of Assad. Um, I think, if anything, the United States focus, besides securing the chemical weapons stockpile, if Assad's regime does ultimately fall, is figuring out a way to, to foster a more inclusive government in the aftermath of civil war um, that ultimately reintegrates the military involving the different variety of different sects um, of the Christians and the Alawites and, and the Sunni and the Shia. And so I think it's going to be that that point that's going to, the, the U.S. has the most leverage ultimately in what really is just a very slippery, chaotic, unpredictable crisis right now. Yeah, I think um, going off of that, I think Syria is such a bleak situation um, in that not only is there such a devastating death, sto death toll, um, but there's just no clear solution. Um, removing Assad, uh, you know, seems like it would be the best solution, but I think a lot of people who may not know um, sort of the demographics of the region don't realize is that without, um, you know, Assad and without sort of that minority of the Alawites ruling, um, it, it's possible that, you know, there will be a lot of uh, ethnic fighting, even after, uh, if Assad were, the regime were to fall. Um, so I think in approaching Syria, there's not only the issue of how do we stop the violence as it's existing right now, but also how to deal with the sort of potential ethnic fallout that may occur after the regime falls. Um, and then as far as the unilateral versus multilateral approach, I think probably what you might have been getting at is the fact that it's very difficult to sort of proceed with anything without having China and Russia uh, sort of, at least, you know, on paper, agreeing to what we're doing. So I think, um, I think Secretary Clinton has, you know, put a lot of effort toward getting Russia on board, um, and there has been, you know, the, the whole peace plan that Kofi Annan laid out um, was valiant in, in theory, I, I guess, but it really hasn't been <laughs> laid out. Um, so I guess definitely we should, you know, keep trying to push that. But it really is just, I know it seems like I'm just blathering about the issue, not laying out a policy, but it's really because a, a pol there is no clear policy. Like, we can't just put out, you know, a prescription and say, like, this is it. Like, Assad needs to go. That's the solution. Um, there's a lot of different issues, and I'm just trying to like point out all of these things that make it so difficult to come up with one resounding solution. Yeah, I would like. I mean, at first, I really didn't like what you were saying, but now I liked it a lot more as it. <laughs> but like, I, I definitely agree that there's so much that we. There are so many variables and so many factors that there's no way to know that if we go in and do one thing or another, that we're not going to mess something up. But I mean, I think that there's a great historical example in. Uh, in Chile, when Salvador Allende was elected, he was a socialist, he was elected by the people there to represent their government, and this was in the midst of the Cold War, so the United States decided the best thing to do was to arm a coup and get rid of Allende, because he, uh, he was a baddie, he was a socialist, he was a communist, and so we, you know, we armed the coup and we put Pinochet in power, and surprise, Pinochet was a fascist and killed a lot more people. So I don't think that we can just easily come up with all these great ideas like, oh, we need to take out Assad. And I, I also, of course, because I know, I know I'm running into the, into the question of, well, 30,000 people are already dead. Something needs to be done to stop that. And I think that, that that is a valid concern, but I question our track record and whether we can actually do anything that's, that we know is certainly not going to mess things up. I, I have a question real quick just to see if, does anybody think that Syria's problem will be resolved short of either the rebels killing Assad and overthrowing him, or Assad suppressing. I think it's more likely to be resolved if it's a rebel victory than if it's a government victory. And yeah. that's just speaking to, like, civil can wars. Can the rebels win? Civil wars, can they win? 
you think that you think there's a legitimate I, chance that they'll win? Yeah, I, so think, so. I think so. Like, yeah. from I mean, they've a, a, obtained a number of victories on the border with Turkey, which I think is... I think, actually, Turkey's role coming up in the future is going to be... Yeah, I'm very curious to see what happens, because yeah. there already, there's already been a number of cross-border sort of situations, and uh, that would be particularly interesting as Turkey is a member of NATO. Um, hopefully that wouldn't uh, draw anyone too quickly into conflict. What is interesting, though, about civil wars and how they've ended in the past 20 years is that negotiated settlements as normatively, you know, preferable as it might be, like at the end of the day, ultimately five times less successful than a victory on one side or the other. And a rebel victory is four times more likely than a government victory to actually result in sustainable peace. So despite the fact that there are many different strands of, of the rebellion and it's not easy to watch all of them fight it out, um, just speaking like statistically about what usually happens in civil wars and what leads to peace more likely than not, it seems like that really is the best thing that the United States can hope for, assuming that chemical weapons are not <laughs> But then what, what constitutes a critical mass of rebellion? Like, you know, are a couple anarchists in no, this is a civil Oregon a good enough rebellion to no, take a, down a civil the United war. States? A civil war. And a civil war, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to define it, but the standard metric is a thousand deaths per year being but what a civil that's war That's such is. an arbitrary number. I think that you're running into a significant knowledge problem with any of these, like, large grand prescriptions. I think, uh, I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous to think that you can know what to do in oh, such no, a large it's, situation. Yeah, I don't think that's predictable. Like, no, and I don't think that you should necessarily rely on all these past, but obviously there, there have been plenty of rebel victories that have then just relapsed into recurrence of civil war, and you have one civil war, you're also more likely to have another one than if you had no one at all. So certainly there's no easy answer, but in thinking about what would be best hypothetically, I don't know how else you can make policy pres prescriptions if not thinking about what past case examples we've had and Do having we need policy prescriptions then? Maybe, uh, maybe that's a good answer. Well, inaction is a policy prescription in a lot of ways too. Okay, fair enough. So.